Welcome to the Bonner Broadcast, a Bonner Pipeline Project Initiative where we are providing professional development resources for civically engaged leaders in the higher education and nonprofit sector. In this series, we will be focusing on leadership and how we can create effective change within our teams, programs, careers, and within ourselves. Up first, we'll be diving into power relationships, what they are, and how to balance power as a leader. Before we jump in, I want to introduce our featured guests who will be sharing their experience and insight throughout this training. My name is Nate Green. I am a rising graduating senior, political science major from Washington, D.C. I am the senior Bonner intern for Bonner Office of Community Service Bonner Scholars Program. Um, and I do it because, you know, I've had a passion for service. Um, and within my cohort, um, the young men always look to me as their leader, um, even before I even had a title. So my director was like, you know, you're going to be the senior bond intern for your class. And it ended up happening, actually. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I'm the head of the senior leadership team. My name is James Shields. I'm the director of the Bonner Center for Community Service and Learning here at Guilford College. Well, I started in 2001, so a um, little over 18 years. I uh, came into this actually um, kind of later in life. I was a... Uh, an adult student at Guilford College, and um, my intent was to be a, a be a history professor. And not long after I got my degree uh, at Guilford, this um, the position in the Bonner Center opened up, and it uh, sounded very intriguing to me. It's something that I've been involved in. I've worked with youth um, most of my professional life, uh, regardless of what kind of job I had, and, and this idea of being able to work with um, college students. Uh, making a difference, uh, while at the same time helping them to develop skills, uh, kind of helping them with their transformation um, was was just very appealing to me. And um, so that's really why I do it. My name is Katie Zanecki. I am the, I'm an assistant director in the Center for Academic Community Engagement, or ACE, at Siena. Um, I'm the Bonner director here. Very proud to be the Bonner director. I graduated from Siena in 2014 after being a member of our Bonner program. Um, I came and worked in the office in a few different capacities, and then um, last year came on as the, the Bonner director. So um, I have been involved as a mentor and been able to um, stay close to the program in my other roles, but I am really excited to be in this role um, supporting the program that meant so much to me as a student and did so much, opened so many doors for me. So um, that's a little bit about me, what I'm doing now. Um, and, you know, I love working with our students and being able to, like I said, be part of the program um, from a different lens and different point of view. Now that we've gotten to know our guests a little bit better, let's dive right in. Each episode of this series will include different concepts and opinions of our guests, so it may be helpful to keep a pen and paper nearby to jot down some notes that you want to remember. At the end of this episode, there will be an interactive piece for you to participate in so you can apply all that you've learned to real-life scenarios. We've got a lot to learn today, so let's get started. Before we can get in too far, we need to come to terms with what is power, what is a power relationship, and how do they affect our lives and our leadership capabilities? First, what is power? Power, as defined in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, is the possession of control, authority, or influence over others. An important aspect we need to consider is that sometimes power is not always a conscious choice, but a privilege that some people have, whether intentional or not. It is important for us to be aware of the power that we may hold in order to use it to uplift and empower those who experience marginalization and injustice in our communities. To give us some food for thought about power and its role in our lives, Mr. Shields from Guilford College has some questions for us to reflect on. Will your use of power eventually uh, damage the relationship? Will it get to a point where you're not as effective? as you could be. You're not really meeting the mission because there's this kind of pull in terms of power. But uh, to me, I think a healthy uh, relationship is uh, while, you, while you recognize power, but at the same time, you don't, you don't abuse it. So based on that information about power, what is a power relationship? Katie Sinecki from Ziena College breaks down the different components of power relationships for us. 
So I think about um, the relationship between supervisors and employees primarily, um, but I also think that power can be, you know, thinking about people's identity, you know, are you male or female, you know, how do people identify, um, and so I think there's a lot that can be wrapped into power, especially in supervisor to employee relationships or, you know, honor director to students, professors to students. I think a lot can be wrapped up in that. Um, but to like very simply put it, I think it's either, you know, identity or um, what is your relationship between the two people. It's important to note that power relationships are not just built on authority, but can also stem from other sources. Mr. Shields explains this more here. When you think about a power uh, relationship, a lot of times it's um, not only who has the authority, and uh, you know, a lot of times this is authority that's not necessarily earned, uh, but the reality is this, these people have um or, or organizations for that matter, they have authority, but also who has the resources, right? Uh, especially when we're thinking about uh, the relationship between between a college and a community partner, especially a, a small uh, nonprofit that's, that's trying to get, get things done. And so we, we try to be cognizant of that dynamic in that, yes, while we may have the resources to help you build capacity uh we we don't want to use that as a way to sway power as as a way to i guess set the agenda at this point i think we need to state that power can be perceived in many different ways the very definition differs from person to person based on their individual experiences this is something a leader has to be very aware of and be respectful of how their power may be communicated or interpreted if you still aren't quite getting the grasp of what a power relationship looks like in action, here's a visual to give you some examples of power relationships that might form within the Bonner network and individual Bonner programs. As you can see, the combinations of power relationships are endless. Power is in relationships between students, students to staff, staff to staff, students to community partners, and the list goes on. Here's an example of a real situation that leaders in the Bonner network have faced and how they are responding. Actually, right now, we're kind of going through a, a, a interesting power dynamic with one of our community partners in that uh, we have a we have a small uh, difference of opinion about an approach to help a particular family, and uh, right now we're we're kind of at an impasse in that uh, they feel like they've done as much as they can do. We're kind of pressing them because one, because the family is in desperate need, and so we have to kind of step back and you know, how much do we press you know the partner uh, to the point that maybe we're 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 uh, damaging the relationship. So I think when you look at a power um, dynamic, especially in the work that we do, you you really have to take that into account. Now let's take a couple minutes to pause this video and reflect on how you would define power and power relationships based on your experience. Also reflect on what power you may hold, what power relationships you have, and how that power might be perceived. So now that we know what a power relationship is and what power looks like, all of this information begs the question, what does a healthy power relationship look like? Katie Zanecki and Nate Green give us some really good insight into this question. I think. Um particularly for the person who has power to recognize that they have power in that relationship. Um, and sometimes I think it even means saying, like, I, I recognize that I am, you know, the person who has power in this, in this situation. Um, and hopefully saying, you know, I, I want to break that power down. <laughs> I want to, you know, um, move beyond that. Um, I think that's an important part of it, but I think building a relationship um, to to understand people for who they are, understand their identities, um, what they bring to the table in terms of skills and knowledge, but also, you know, what do they bring to the table that might hold them back that our previous experiences with bad power relationships or leadership or just personal experiences in general. 
While relationships and feelings are not all that a power relationship should include, it is the foundation of the start of a healthy power relationship. You can only treat a person fairly, communicate with them well, and allow them the power they warrant in the relationship if you respect the person and value their thoughts and feelings. Nate Green goes another direction with the same premise of respecting the relationship and the people you are leading. He also touches on a really important power balance in peer relationships. Let's take a listen. I personally think leadership, it goes beyond just, you know, a leader, you know, having that voice for the people. Um, I believe it's somebody um, who listens first, learns second, and then lead. Um, because a person who just jumps in and lead really hasn't shown they learned anything, really haven't shown that they listen to the group. A leader understand that first must listen to the group because every group of people are different, learn from them, and adapt his leadership to their um, ways of life. Because the only thing that changes sometimes is the group that you're working with. And as a leader, you can't stay constant. You have to continuously change your leadership styles to fit the group instead of the group fitting your leadership. Um, mm -hmm. For me personally, I believe a power relationship isn't necessarily a ranking. It's not necessarily um, one over top of each other. It can be as simple as a friendship turned into a power relationship because of the type of individuals that they are. Um, I believe, again, it's all about the leadership styles, um, and it goes deeper than that. It goes into the relationship aspect of that. The power piece comes in when we are you know, trying to differentiate hey, I'm a leader, but there's a group of my friends in the same group that I'm leading, right? Yeah. So sometimes you have to exert your power um, to, you know, get your friends to come up under that belt. Can you be a leader amongst your friends? Um, it's one of the big things. Are you able to differentiate when it's time to be a friend and when it's time to be a leader? Um, and I believe that comes in the big play when you're talking about power relationships and power dynamics. So for me personally, power relationship is your ability to differenti differentiate between a different roles that you play when you are a leader. You're a friend, you're a family, you're, you know, you're everything. When it's time to be that leader, can you take back and be a leader? There's so much that goes into a healthy power relationship, and we could literally spend all day dissecting the topic, but I think Katie and Nate really summed the necessary foundation up well. However, we do need to face the facts that we are human and we are prone to failure. Sometimes we strive to maintain a healthy relationship, but we don't. We mess up, we miscommunicate, and we abuse our power. Mr. Shields from Guilford College gives us some really impactful and challenging advice on how to restore those unhealthy and broken relationships. Well, I think you have to find a certain level of uh, humility. You, you have to evaluate how you got to that point. What role did you play? What, what steps could you have taken? Mm -hmm. to uh, keep from getting to, to that point. And in most cases, you can't necessarily reverse what has happened, but I think just simply, uh, at least for the aggrieved party, uh, just simply acknowledging that, yeah, we could have done this better, or maybe we should have approached you in this way. Maybe we should have uh, had a face-to-face -face conversation instead of going back and forth from email where you're not really sure about a person's tone or whether somebody is, is really uh, upset about what's going on, are they apathetic or whatever, you really don't know through an email. And then, and then just um, establishing you know, some protocols for the future. So how are we gonna continue? That's the one thing I, I, I do love about many of our community partners because we've uh, work with them for so long like this this particular community partner we've 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 worked with for over 20 years wow. so you know we're not going to stop working together and at some point maybe as early as tomorrow we are going to get together and we're going to have that conversation um, because at the end of the day we both want the same thing. We want what's best for this particular family and for the community at large. And so I think that's another thing too, you know, uh, um, how do you kind of bring people back, back together when you have this abuse of power is also um, recognizing the uh, commonalities that, that you have. Uh, once again, we, we both want what's best for the community. We, we may have different ways of, uh, 
achieving that goal. We may have different approaches, but at the end of the day, we're all trying to do the same thing. So I think that, if nothing else, that's something that, that you can build on. Mr. Shields touches on some really practical and important action steps. And our student perspective, Nate Green, also talks about some key important mindsets that both parties need to strive towards in order for the relationship to even begin to take the steps talked about by Mr. Shields. I believe that it comes with trust. And, and I, I know that's cliche, but it's, it's an important component of understand, trust and understanding uh, people. One thing that I always tell each of my senior leaders is that you're leading a group of people for about 180 days. You should know the ins and outs about this person. You should know how they feel down. You should know when they are not themselves. You should know this. I and mean, so it's just understanding that you as a leader, you have to let your pride go sometimes um, and make compromises that, you know, may be uncomfortable. But that's why they are deeming you as a leader, because you're able to be comfortable in the uncomfortable. It starts with trust and it starts with understanding uh, who you are leading and who you are following. Um, those two steps, I believe, can help repair even quicker. Now, it's not going to happen overnight, but I believe it speeds up the process of repairing that power relationship. And you get out of a, well, you're my supervisor or, you know, well, I'm not the supervisor. It's just a simple, like, we have respect for each other. Let's move forward. Business is business. We don't have to like each other at the end of the day, but we, in this space, we must respect each other. Um, and trust one another. Lastly, Katie Zanecki gives us some really valuable insight into preventing unhealthy power relationships from even beginning to take root. Let's listen in. I think for both, in a sense, it's taking a step, taking some time to pause and think about how the relationship's going um, for, for everyone in the relationship. And sometimes that means going to someone outside of it, um, whether it's a colleague or, um, you know, a peer or whoever it is, but going to them and trying to talk through with them, um, you know, I, I might need your help to, um, you know, have a conversation with my supervisor or this other, you know, this other person that I'm working with to say, um, here's, I, I see that things aren't going well, or there, there's a potential for them to not go well. Um, and, in a sense, having like a mediated talking circle, you know, type conversation um, where everyone, you know, you go in clearly setting the stage that this is a safe space and you want to move things forward and you want it to be productive, um, but that you have to have a conversation about it. Because if you ignore it, it's just going to get worse and it's just going to continue to, um, you know, diminish in how you're working together. So when you see something going, wrong or things actually just have gone to that point where the relationship isn't good anymore you have to kind of pause and it's really difficult but you have to have that difficult conversation to address it so that you can move forward otherwise um you know it it might mean someone leaving whatever the relationship is the program the office you know and, and you don't want to see that happen Overall, the three insights given point to the fact that we need to realize and be aware of our own humanity, where we could get stuck, as well as the value of the relationships that we are a part of, and all the input and value that they bring to the table. I know I keep saying that we need to be aware, so let's take a couple minutes to really dig deeper into what it means to be aware. We're going to listen to a couple of our guests talk about creating awareness in their own workspaces as well as in their personal lives. First up, here's Nate Green. I believe number one, it starts with educating yourself, educating yourself, uh, because it's really, really important that we have a baseline of who we are, right? You have to think about yourself first, um, and then others. I'll phrase that Bonner uh, Morehouse, um, and I think we probably stole it from some other house, uh, organizations. But a Bonner doesn't go where you know they want to go; they go where they're needed, and that is a that is the mission. That's always been my mission, and I feel like. Me personally, I don't go where I want to go. I go where I'm needed. And uh, it, it even had a change of career plans, you know, uh, not going in straight politics uh, and instead taking the education route because black men in the teaching field are only 2%. So there's a need there and I'm needed and I have a passion for it. So I need to go do it. It's not what I want to do, but I'm needed and I have to do it with a passion. For more of a team aspect, Mr. Shields talks about how he incorporates biases and awareness trainings into his team's development. 
it's, it has become the, the foundation of the training. For example, with our first years, one of the first things that we do is uh, we do a tour of Greensboro and you learn about, you know, some of the some of the aspects of the city that they will be serving in for the next four years that you're probably not going to get on a, a Chamber of Commerce tour. Um, and then we do community asset mapping. We, we, we think it's important for them to see the positive side of this work. We think it's important for them to see the assets that they have to work with, you know, as opposed to, oh, this is a food desert. Oh, this is a Title I school. Oh, this is a school, this is an area, you know, with high crime. Because a lot of times that's how you're introduced to a community. And so that, that can kind of cement your mindset in terms of how you're going to work with the community. And then, and then we do various workshops and presentations and, uh, you know, reflections on, um, on our own identity. Uh, we, have a, we have a fairly diverse Bonner Scholar program. And I won't say fairly diverse, it's extremely diverse actually. And so it's important for us to have these conversations uh, with, within our own group, but also um, to try to have those conversations uh, with our community partners as well. Many, um, many of our students, not just the Bonner students, but many of the Guilford College students that join our, our various sites they don't necessarily have access to the extensive training that Bonner scholars have. But if you're going to go to one of our sites, it's mandatory that you go through some type of cultural uh, competency training. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a major part of the training that we give any student who um, who goes to our site. And I don't know that any of our students before they leave here become totally competent, but I think maybe the the term should be more uh, cultural awareness. It's really easy to go into a community and just simply aware of your own identity. And then you take that into the community and then you begin to make those missteps and you really don't know why. Uh, nearly all of our students, I'd say 100% of our students, when they, when they go into the community, they, they mean well, their hearts are in the right place. But it could be just simply the way they were raised, their their um, geography in terms of where they came from that, you know, for example, we, we do a lot of work in the African community in Greensboro. If, if you've never worked with the African um, community, well then culturally, there are a lot of things that you don't know. There are a lot of customs that you wouldn't be used to. Uh, maybe you don't understand that the African community is diverse. And, and that's just not the African community here in Greensboro, the, the African community. We have people from all over the continent, the Asian community, same thing, uh, the uh, Latinx community, same thing, you know, very diverse. Everybody who speaks Spanish in Greensboro, they don't all come from Mexico, right? And so part of that is dispelling a lot of the preconceived notions that students come um, or, or that they bring in. Uh, to to this work, and we don't want to wait until you're a sophomore, junior, senior, because because our students are, are 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 getting their feet wet almost from day one, and so we, it, I think it really is um, it's our responsibility to at least begin the process of cultural competency uh, as as soon as possible. At this time, I would encourage you to pause this video and take a couple minutes to reflect on your level of awareness as a leader and the unconscious biases you may have. On the screen will be some guiding questions to help you reflect more intentionally. We can talk about awareness all that we want, but the truth is actions are harder than words. As we talked about before, we are human. We are prone to fail. Failure in itself is not inherently bad. In fact, it can be the most useful tool for growth in our lives. However, when we fail to be healthy leaders, it not only affects us, but those we are leading. Because of this, it is healthy to set in place a structure of accountability that will enable us to grow as leaders in an intentional way and limit the negative effects our shortcomings may have on those around us. To get our brains thinking in the right direction, Mr. Shields talks about the mindset necessary when setting up accountability and what the goal of those structures should be. 
Well, I think part of it is to at least begin the idea of leadership from from an ethical standpoint, right? Um, so what does it mean to be an ethical leader? I think when you start from that, then all your decisions, all of the things that you're doing, whether it's working with students, whether it's working with community members, whether it's your own education and pro- professional development, I think if you start from that main um, starting point, the rest will fall into place. It's really fundamental to have a certain level of integrity. Uh, we are we are not going to um, have all the answers. We are not going to uh, be perfect. We 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 will make missteps in working with um, each other and working with community partners. But if people feel like that you have a certain amount of integrity, well then folks will give you a certain amount of grace, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but I'll, but it's also important for, for those people who work under you, people that are on your staff, if, if, if they don't see integrity from you, well, one, they don't really see it as, as um, something that they should do, something that they should emulate with students or whoever else. And so at some point, you know, it also becomes... Uh, part of your reputation, right? Well, these guys, yeah, they they do X amount of hours of service and blah, 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 but you can't really trust them to do this. Or you can't really trust them to follow through. Or they say this, but they send us these kids that are, you know, borderline racist or sexist or homophobes or whatever, you know, because they haven't done, because we say, we're going to do this training. We say we're going to do this work, but you keep sending me these students that are doing this or your institution as a whole, right? So um, I think integrity is crucial. Taking it a step further, if ethical leadership is our personal goal, the next step is to ask, how can we create a culture of change with that mindset and at the same time find a good balance of power? Katie Zanecki touches on this intersection. One of the things that we talk about in our program is that this is their program and it's student led. And so, um, you know, if they don't like a training, they have weekly feedback forms that they do to reflect on it. Um, and so we find out, <laughs> we know that, you know, they didn't like that facilitator or that training. Um, and then they know that they're not going to see that training again or that facilitator in that same way. Making students aware that they have the power to make change if they want it and make this program what they want it to be. Helping students understand anytime that we do have a change, why it's happening as well. Um, so really explaining um, the process behind things, the reason behind things, um, you know, so that they can understand and you know, whether it's students in the leadership team being able to um, advocate to their peers about it, um, or just as everyone um, learns about change, I think helping them to understand why it's happening happening is a really important part. Um, And also them knowing that if they don't like it or they don't like something, um, there's multiple ways that they can share that with us, whether it's coming right to me, whether it's talking to a leadership team member, um, you know, they can advocate for change if they want it. There's a lot that we can't change. Um, You know, in my job, there's things that are happening all the time that I don't have control over. And um, at one point, that was frustrating or scary, um, which I think is a feeling that a lot of people have about change. But I think Part of our job in our center and, you know, in this program is to help people to start to be okay with that. Um, We love the motto, be comfortable with the uncomfortable. And so change is a really big part of making people uncomfortable. Um, And change is good. We we change things because we want to make things better. And so I think it's really important for people to understand that and to know that. and know that it's going to be a normal part of life, both in your professional life, but also in your personal life. You know, things change all the time. Um, so you have to start to figure out what's the way that you're going to cope with that and deal with that. And, um, you know, if you have questions about it, how do you question it? If you're um, upset about it, how do you advocate for not to change? Um, so I think it's really important that we give people the opportunity to learn how to do that here. 
Now I realize that I've been talking a lot about what the person in power would do and not what the person without the power would do. However, I believe that all the information we've been discussing is applicable and important for those without power. Don't be afraid to talk about power with the other party, to reflect if you have any unconscious and biases that are limiting your understanding of the other party. Most importantly, don't be afraid to have a healthy conversation with those who are abusing their power. Katie Zanecki has some more really valuable encouragement for those who are placed in this hard position. I think really talking about needs and feelings and all of those things are really important um, in that type of situation to help everyone understand at the end of the day, like, I think sometimes people forget, like, I'm, I'm talking and working with another human who has feelings and um, needs just like I do. And so I think it's important to kind of reground them in that um, and get away from the, like, he did this, she did that, he did that, and, and get back to, you know, the people at the heart of it. Overall, it is important to find a mentor or support system that will help hold you accountable in your power relationships. It is extremely helpful to have someone to process information with, get healthy advice from, but also to tell you when you're abusing your power, being taken advantage of, or a part of an unhealthy power relationship. Now it's time for What Would You Do? where we give our guest speakers a conflict scenario and hear how they would respond based on their experiences, skills, and leadership styles. It sounds like the, the talk that you would need to have would, would need to be with the leader, um, getting him or her to understand um, a dynamic that he or she may be blind to. It could be in the course of our conversation, uh, you may find that this person is not blind to the dynamic that this is how I want it, right? And then at that point, the institution has to make a decision. Are these the type of leaders that we want? If we say we have ethical leadership, if we say we have transformational leadership, and not just from the top, but throughout the institution, we have to mirror that, right? Mm -hmm. So at some point, someone has to have a conversation with that person and say, you know, you, you really need to change your leadership style. I have seen that happen in ways where, you know, especially in, in higher ed, a lot of the followers are, are young people who are fresh out of college. And the, the thing that I hate the most is to see them discouraged and to see them not get the type of mentorship that they should be getting. And then, or you, you spend all this time uh, training a young person and then they take their skills and knowledge somewhere else because you haven't created uh, a, a professionally nurturing environment. And that's dangerous in, in terms of any major initiative that you might want to start. But yeah, but I would have a serious conversation with, uh, with the leader with the idea that it's, um, it's essential that they, that they change their approach. And so all of a sudden now you find yourself as an administrator, you find yourself as a leader and because you don't have the requisite skills that you should have to be a leader, so then you um, rely on your authority. You rely, you rely on your power to do your job and to keep other folks at bay. So, so yeah, so I, 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 I would certainly have a serious conversation with that person, um, creating clear, clear goals into uh, changing their approach. And even, you know, encouraging them to, um, to, to utilize their followers, to, to utilize their, their skills, seeing your role as a mentor. And I think, you know, regardless of the maturity level of your staff, if you're a leader, you are in a mentoring role. And, and you should keep that in mind, and that, and that it's not about you being up front. Um, you just simply um, using this as a stepping stone to the next thing, right? Um, which we see that a lot as well. But then the uh, institution suffers, the mission of your department or your school suffers when it's just for personal gain. And, you know, because, because what happens is then you meet that goal, you, um, you get to that point that you want to get to, 
and then you leave the institution. But in a lot of cases, you um, they, they find out after you left that you left a mess. I think it depends on who the person is, what type of relationship you have with them, um, kind of going back to those power relationships. If it's, um, you know, a supervisor, I don't know that I'm going to be as comfortable saying something, um, you know, to someone that is in power, um, maybe talking to someone that is a mentor in the office that has a little bit more power than me, or maybe a better relationship with them than I do, or a different relationship, you know, I, I don't expect that um, my supervisor and I are necessarily going to have the type of relationship where we can have conversations about, um, you know, critiquing, critiquing them, or even, you know, super friendly conversations about what's going on in, in, in depth about um, our, each other's lives. So I think that sometimes seeking a mentor or someone else in the office that you know, um, you can rely on to have a productive version of that conversation and not, you know, going and like gossiping to them and saying, this is the issue I'm having and just venting and letting it out without trying to be productive and move things forward. Um, so I think that's one way to deal with it. I think um, if it's a colleague, if you feel comfortable having a conversation with them to say, you know, it, it comes to my attention, whether it's from observations or people sharing with me that, um, you know, this might not be the best way to go about working with the team um, and talking about how can, how can you kind of address and fix things so that um, they move to being more productive um, and inclusive and working with everyone. And then I think a somewhat similar conversation with students. Um, I think with students, it, they might just not know. <laughs> they may not realize that that's what they're doing necessarily. And so um, I think for everyone, it's really a learning experience, but students are in the headspace and they're in the place here at, at school and in the Bonner program where they're ready to learn and, um, you know, hopefully open to that. So I think, um, you know, really using it as a learning experience and a teaching moment for them to help them understand, um, you know, what they're doing and how they can, how they can change that. It reminds me a little bit of leadership compass and, um, you know, maybe it's, it's doing leadership compass with the team and having them realize like, wow, I'm really North and I need to move a little bit more towards South or somewhere else. Um, so I think, using tools like that and, and really honest and open conversations um, is really important. Now it's your turn. How would you respond to this situation? Pause the video for a couple minutes and reflect on your response. Remember to be aware of any biases or unhealthy thought patterns that may impede on your healthy decision-making skills. And that's a wrap for this episode in the series, Creating Agents of Change of the Bonner Broadcast. Episode two of this series is Lead in, lead out, where we're going to be discussing the value and power of following in a team setting. This series is a part of the Bonner Pipeline Project and can be found on the Bonner Network YouTube channel or on our website, bonner.org. Subscribe to our channel for more trainings and resources. This episode has been made possible thanks to Claire Blim, Liz Brandt, Sarah Byler, Maria Guevara Carpio, Dr. Ari Hoy, and the Bonner Pipeline Project Committee. Special thanks to our featured guests, Nate Green, James Shield, and Katie Zanecki. Music in this episode was produced by Ben Sound. Thanks for taking time to learn with me today. Bonner love! <laughs>